Welcome to the Agent of Wealth podcast with Mark Boudis from Boudis Financial. In this podcast, Mark helps guide you towards financial freedom, ensure you never run out of money, and create a balance in life that prioritizes what is most important to you. Join us for this journey as Mark draws from years of expertise and guest experts to solve the multiple wealth building challenges involved in your financial life. Welcome back to the Agent of Wealth. This is your host, Mark Boudis. On today's show, we're going to talk to David Lesperance and Melvin Warshaw. David's the managing partner of Lesperance and Associates, one of the world's leading international tax and immigration advisors. Melvin's a highly regarded longtime U.S. cross border tax and private client attorney, now in sole practice in the U.S. They have over 75 years of combined experience, making them an unparalleled resource for anyone dealing with the complex legal issues surrounding expatriation and U.S. tax. Together, David and Melvin have successfully advised scores of U.S. and non-U.S. high and ultra-high net worth individuals and their families on a wide range of personal and business tax matters, especially in connection with cross-border income and estate tax planning and compliance in the U.S. They have also co-authored many articles in their field and have been published by leading media outlets. David and Melvin, welcome to the show. Pleasure, Mark. Thank you very much for having us. Yeah, so I'm looking forward to today's topic. I think the complexity that's involved in normal tax matters. And then once you throw on international cross-border uh, things to it, it can get really complex. How did you both get started in dealing with international tax? I began my career working for the Internal Revenue Service. And then about uh, 25 years into my practice, I began focusing on wealthy clients in the estate planning area. And uh, I was fortunate to be a partner at McDermott, Will & Emery, which is an international law firm based in the United States. And uh, after I left there and worked for J.P. Morgan, private bank, also handling cross-border situations to some extent, uh, I decided to focus almost exclusively in this area because of my technical background. I also have a master's in tax from Georgetown University Law Center. Uh, I decided that uh, there were very few top-notch practitioners in this area, and it was a great niche for me. Okay. And Dave? I am the child of an auto of the auto industry. I was born in Windsor, Ontario. My father would wake up in Canada every day and go work in Detroit. It was quite common uh, back then, so I kind of grew up with this cross-border stuff at the breakfast table. Uh, I went on not thinking I was going to do this in the future, but uh, actually worked as a, both a customs and immigration officer at the Windsor-Detroit Tunnel, busiest car entry, and Toronto Airport, busiest air entry. And then uh, in 1990, I either saw the light or went to the dark side and got called to the bar and uh, started really immediately focusing on high net worth clients originally coming into Canada. And because one of the things is the this area is, is constantly changing, I really started looking at all the different potential lineage citizenship my siblings and I happened to marry a lot of Europeans, so I had that, again, as a personal experience. And then really doing my first U.S. expatriation in 1990. And the United States, very pretty unique citizenship-based taxation, is the most complicated jurisdiction both in leaving and inbound, in my experience. And I look at all the different jurisdictions. So let's talk a little bit about the leaving aspect. And I guess the leaving could be temporary or it could be permanent. Let's start on the temporary side and maybe it turns into permanent. Let's say they're working wherever they're, they're going. What things do they need to do to maintain their tax compliance while they're overseas? So let's assume, Mark, that the individual is a U.S. citizen. Perhaps they have a green card while they're working abroad. The first thing that comes into mind is you indicated the person's working would be that the U.S. permits a foreign earned income exclusion of roughly $120,000 today. But everything above that is potentially subject to U.S. tax. However, if you live in a country such as in the EU that has its own tax and your services are performed in that European country, then you have to hope that the U.S tax treaty with that country would prevent double taxation on the amount of earned income in above $120,000. And there are similar rules in the tax treaties to try to prevent 
double taxation of passive income from sources outside the U.S., but it's not always a perfect match, and there can be a mistiming, as we could describe later, but it's, it's complicated. What happens in the event that, you know, they take the scenario that we're talking about, they go move um, to, let's say, somewhere in, in Europe, but all their work is still done in the U.S., and I think we saw this one a lot during the pandemic, where some people just left the country and said, okay, I can do my work from anywhere. Their business was not in Europe, but they were residing in Europe at the time. What are some of the things they have to think about or to, to comply with? Well, they're both an immigration and a tax issue here. Whether they're a digital nomad or somebody who is returning to the country of their birth or a citizenship that they acquired through lineage or naturalization, when they go, they have to consider what are the immigration and tax rules in the place they're going to. Are they complying with those rules? Are they running afoul of those rules? They need to make sure that they, they comply with them. Because they're U.S. citizens in our scenario, they will continue to be U.S. persons for tax purposes and have U.S. tax issues to deal with and compliance that Mel was just talking about. But they have to either avoid or be aware of what are going to be the immigration and tax issues in the jurisdiction that they're going to be in. And you mentioned something interesting about the, the lineage. Does the person in this scenario have to have tax compliance on the U.S. side where they are a U.S. citizen, but maybe through lineage they come from Portugal and they decide to buy real estate or some asset in Portugal? You know, what is the U.S. aspect of that? The fact that they, they are a U.S. citizen and then they have assets overseas. Is there tax requirements on those as well in terms of, let's say, it's an investment property or rental property over there? So in general, uh, since 2010 with FATCA, the U.S. requires uh, reporting of all foreign financial assets, but not real estate, but financial assets. So I have a client who David is aware of, and this client lives in Portugal but didn't realize that she had to report her Portuguese limited company to the U.S. because she's a U.S. citizen. And similarly, if she has both personal and business bank accounts in Portugal, she has an obligation to file FBARs. The filing threshold is very low, $10,000 of all foreign bank accounts in the year. And uh, we discovered that her unaware accountant had never filed her personal bank accounts on an FBAR. And FBAR violations are pretty serious because of the Department of Justice's relentless pursuit of bad fact patterns in which they've created a very good set of precedent for imposing 50% civil willfulness penalties for not filing a, an FBAR. And so FBARs and additional foreign financial reporting, as in the case of this woman, because she controlled a foreign company. She had to report the foreign company to the U.S. Internal Revenue Service, even though it never turned a profit. You mentioned FBAR and you mentioned filing. Is it mostly filing or is there could be tax implications dependent upon what is filed? Oh, yes. So let's pretend that my client in Portugal made a profit. Well, under the, since 2017, the United States will take the position that a portion of that profit from her active business is reported currently in the U.S., even though she never repatriated the dividends to herself as a U.S. individual. So it's phantom income. It's another of the this guilty tax, which is what I'm referring to, is just another form of anti-deferral tax regimes that the U.S. has put into the tax code. This is an, an area that's so complex that Mel and I wrote a three-part article, probably seven, 8,000 words, on just highlighting some of the issues and some of the strategies. You can find that on either one of our web pages that, to go into a deeper dive. And we used the example, and we actually started writing a column called American Exceptionalism, because Americans do have an exceptionally complicated situation, and that's because of the citizenship-based taxation and the green card taxation liability. And so the column we did was for this phenomena of a lot of Americans are reading in the press about going to Portugal. So we talked about going to Portugal, but it's applicable, you know, whether they were going to go to Italy or Bali or Cayman. Uh, all these issues would, would still arise for them. So let's say we have this scenario where the person is in Portugal, for example, and let's say maybe they're spending more and more time in Portugal, and they say, you know what, 
I don't want to deal with this cross-border dealings anymore. Does it make sense at that point to renounce their U.S. citizenship? And if it does, what is involved in, in doing that? So from a U.S. tax point of view, there are two considerations. The bar for being subject to the U.S. exit tax is very low. One of the thresholds is having a personal net worth of $2 million. That $2 million number does not adjust for inflation. It's probably a 40-year-old figure. So it's begun to capture middle-class people and obviously all wealthy people. And the question is, what can be done about it? Well, the exit tax is basically a 23.8% mark-to-market long-term capital gain tax on your worldwide appreciated assets. Now, what most people don't realize, Mark, is that in 2008, U.S. Congress introduced a second tax, and that is a U.S. inheritance tax on recipients from a covered expatriate. I'll give you an example. If an individual has a $3 million net worth, but it's all in cash, they will be classified as a covered expatriate because they have more than $2 million of net worth. However, they're not subject to the exit tax because their only asset is cash. Cash is not an appreciated asset. However, if they go on and move to Hong Kong or Europe and create a $100 million business and they have U.S. heirs, since they're classified as a covered expatriate on the day they renounce or they give up their green card and abandon it, then their heirs will be subject to a 40% inheritance tax when they receive it, even if covered expatriate is dead 40 years. It's a very pernicious, onerous tax. Not a lot of U.S. tax professionals fully understand it, but it's something that David and I talk about with our clients every day because we view the inheritance tax as more problematic than, frankly, the exit tax. So that citizenship stays with you a long time. And this is, we're actually, we work together. So I call myself a tax-savvy immigration advisor. And Mel would be an immigration-savvy tax advisor. And you need to work in a coordinated manner. And again, we did a four-part series on all the elements you need to consider when considering giving yourself the option of expatriation. And so the first element is, because of citizenship-based taxation, you need to have another citizenship. Now, you may have that one from birth because you became naturalized. You may have it from lineage because you have somebody from the old country or maybe you did Aliyah in Israel. Or maybe you have moved to another country already and become naturalized there. Or you can go out. There are some countries which have said, in lieu of a naturalization period, we'll take some type of investment or fee. And those are called citizenship by investment programs. That's one element. We'll call that fire insurance. But you also need to design a fire escape plan to be able to either avoid or minimize the two taxes, the exit tax and the inheritance tax that Mel just mentioned. And so it's designing this kind of fire insurance and fire escape plan that you do together and in coordination. And we deal with a lot of advisors who are quite used to dealing with what I'll call fire prevention. Those would be gifting programs, grats, all the normal kind of domestic planning that you would do. And we'll continue with this analogy. If you think of the tax the rich wildfire that is out there, We're looking at all kinds of proposals from a billionaire tax to taxing unrealized capital gains to loss of step up to a tax on grats and all the normal fire prevention. We really recommend that that clients look into getting a fire insurance and fire escape plan because the cost of acquiring the fire insurance and the fire escape plan is fairly minimal. It depends on kind of the family situation. They can also calculate the cost of any exit tax or inheritance tax, depending on the strategy, and you've mitigated that, you can set that off and say, well, if this proposal comes in, this is what my tax bill increases by. So it's worth paying the premium for the fire insurance and fire escape plan. Or triggering the plan is going to cost more than the tax impact. Give some objectivity into making that decision. It is ultimately a subjective decision because, you know, we're well aware of the fact that giving up U.S. citizenship is not just a financial decision, it's an emotional decision. And part of that is also making sure that the family members who are going to be impacted are going to not only tolerate but actually like and enjoy the future tax and lifestyle situation. You mentioned a good point. It's it's not just financial numbers. 
emotions do come into play and, and lifestyle. What are you seeing as the most common reason that people are looking to either renounce their citizenship or expatriate or get out of the country? Is it strictly for I'm not happy with the taxes that I have to pay here or is there other factors that are coming into play? Well, I would say that it's not only the taxes they have to pay, but also the record keeping, the accounting fees. Clients today, particularly those with businesses overseas, are forced to cord and submit voluminous reports to the IRS about their overseas income. Since 2017, the U.S. has shifted from a worldwide tax system to what's called the territorial tax system, which naturally favors the U.S. What happened in 2017 is that Congress, with the help of some of the uh, large corporations, basically told all multinational corporations, you must repatriate all of your earnings and profits that are sitting in Ireland or low-tax jurisdictions to the IRS and pay a 15% tax. So a company like Apple repatriated through $250 billion back to the U.S. So multiply that and you'll see all this money coming into the U.S. from pre-2018 earnings and profits. And then going forward, there's essentially phantom current income on a portion of your business income earned abroad. There's only one country that could really have a tax system that calls for that, and that's the U.S. It's rather unusual. If I could just go back and add a a comment about the optimal planning opportunity, Mark, in a pre-expatriation situation, one of the things that David and I see, unfortunately too late, is individuals who come to us and say, David, can you help me get a second passport in a couple months because I want to expatriate this year? From a U.S. tax planning perspective in setting up a pre-expatriation trust, it's probably too late. The Internal Revenue Service takes the position, and I'm not going to tell you whether I agree or don't agree, but this is their position, and I respect it in my planning, and that is that any gifts that you make in the year, the calendar year in which you expatriate, you have a zero lifetime exemption. So what I do in November and December is I typically have several clients that are setting up pre-expatriation trusts. They'll put 10 or $12 million into it, use up their lifetime exemption, because that's the last year in which they'll have a lifetime exemption in the U.S., because the U.S. Internal Revenue Service takes a position that in the year you expatriate, you have a zero lifetime exemption, because on the last day of the year, December 31st, you're no longer a U.S. citizen. And so what I do is we typically try to put into the expatriation trust highly appreciated assets because those are the assets that are going to be subject to exit tax. The purpose of the pre-expatriation trust is twofold. One, avoid exit tax on any assets that are in the trust and that might appreciate while in the trust. And number two, as long as the individual who sets up the pre-expatriation trust has not yet been classified as a covered expatriate, then any distributions to U.S. individuals as beneficiaries is not subject to inheritance tax. At what point is the best or optimal time to engage someone like the two of you? Well, it, it depends on a couple of factors. So one of the things is in order to give yourself the optionality of being able to leave, you need to have another citizenship. Now, if you've already got one, fine. A mistake that many clients say is like, oh, I've got an Irish mother. I'm entitled to an Irish passport. Well, it's not like you dial 1-800-IM-IRISH and a leprechaun delivers the passport to you. There's a process, and that's quite backlogged. So the fastest lineage citizenships you're going to see are 8 to 10 months. Other people will say, oh, I can get a citizenship from so Caribbean island that offers citizenship by investment. I see here that they say they can be done in three months. That's salesman's puffery. Mel and I have a case going on right now. I just saw yesterday a, a country which claimed to do it in, in three months, and we've been told, because we do these all the time, that we're now looking at really a year total processing time. So when you take into account that we may have a wildfire if the Democrats hit a trifecta in November of next year, that's only 19, 18, 19 months. That's not a lot of runway left. And you mentioned earlier, what what are the reasons why? Yes, tax traditionally is the reason that was the major driver to do this. But over the last couple of years, particularly, we've seen a lot more non-tax issues 
which are motivating. And oftentimes, clients are motivated by more than one thing to, to get a backup plan. And those are things as diverse as a rise in anti-Semitism, a recognition of gun violence. And, you know, these clients have children and grandchildren, and, and they may know statistically that their children aren't going to be part of a mass shooting event. But as one client said to me, but I'm 100% certain that my kids are going to go through active shooter drills. And I just don't want that stress. I don't want the stress every time I turn on the TV and I see a helicopter flying over a school. Is that my kid's school? Or that I see them walk out the door to go to McDonald's. Is this going to be the day? That's not a stress that people feel anywhere but the United States. And so that's an issue. There's all kinds of anti-Asian, anti-black, LGBTQ. Um, there's all kinds of, uh, of different reasons and motivations that clients say, I'm a bit concerned. I may not be financially or emotionally at the stage of giving up my citizenship, but I may want to leave for a temporary, and that temporary purpose may be there's a hurricane that just hit our house and, you know, I need to move somewhere else for a short period of time to, I'm going to, I don't like where things are going. I'm going to leave for some temporary or more permanent basis. And I have the ability to give up my U.S. citizenship. I don't think I'm emotionally or financially there. But they may be in the future. So it, it's all about giving clients optionality. It sounds like you're saying the second citizenship is kind of the starting point of the process. Like you said, it could take up to a year. Are you seeing people who kind of start the preparation, even though they kind of haven't finalized the decision yet, if they're going to do it, just so that they are ready to kind of pull that trigger when they feel the time is, is right? So I would say that that's actually how David and I met. David and I met about three, four years ago when we were both working on a very large expatriation. This particular individual, California Silicon Valley entrepreneur, in 2015, he got himself a Maltese passport through David, and the individual knew that he wanted to work or live in Europe and wanted that type of optionality. He didn't know when he was going to pull the plug. Finally, in 2021, David got him an interview at a consulate in the Far East, and uh, he did walk into the consulate and renounce his U.S. citizenship. By then, he was settled in Switzerland, and he has what's called a forfait in Switzerland, because for this individual, it was all about taxes. He lived in California. California has the highest state income tax of over 12 percent. And so he wanted out from under California and the U.S. tax system. Again, Mel's been dealing with this, I will say, without giving specifics, longer than I have. But I've been dealing with it for over 30 years. There are not a lot of tax lawyers that really know this stuff. And again, I, on the other side, there are lots of, you know, go on the Internet, you'll find lots of people, salespeople trying to sell you citizenships. But, you know, to find experience, non-conflicted, I don't take commissions from any country or developer or fund manager or anything. So my advice is completely unconflicted and agnostic. Each of us are a bit of, of a unicorn. And so when I ran across Mel, I go, oh, guy is one of the few U.S. tax lawyers. And I deal with a lot of U.S. tax lawyers who are excellent at fire prevention, but very few are used to the fire escape plan. And we have clients coming and saying, okay, give me the comparison between Singapore, Dubai, Italy, Switzerland, the U.K. non-DOM system, Canada, etc. And there just aren't a lot of advisors who can talk to all those jurisdictions and design and actually implement plan and, and pull together oftentimes, you know, we'll need to pull in local lawyers in, in given jurisdictions. But it's, it's very rare uh, to find other unicorns. Once that process starts and you start looking at different countries or start pursuing a, a second citizenship, is there anything that, that gets triggered on the U.S. side where now they come in and say, okay, now you're a, a covered expatriate or you're now have to fall into this, or is it done kind of separately? Well, no, you can acquire a second passport without any implications for your U.S. citizenship. You need to understand that if you're going to live abroad, you're going to have to 
go through the FBAR filings and the FATCA filings, and maybe if you have a foreign corporation, that filing. And I'm sure David can uh, address the issue of how difficult it is for Americans abroad to open up bank accounts because no foreign financial institutions want to be uh, in the situation of having to d- disclose the account that they hold in a foreign country back to the U.S. Internal Revenue Service. David, your thoughts? Yeah, it's it's the compliance costs at a lot of financial institutions. When an American walks in the door versus name any other country, the, the bank is sitting there saying there's a whole bunch more compliance that I have to deal with for this American that I've signed off to the Treasury to do than I do for the Canadian or the Kiwi or the Brit or the whomever. And one of the things, to get to your point, when you trigger either the exit, you're doing that consciously. You, there's no impact on you from a U.S. tax point of view until you either decide I'm going to move out, remain an American, but start declaring, you know, have foreign bank accounts and start declaring a, a foreigner an income exemption, or till you actually either give up your U.S. citizenship or what's called your long-term permanent residence or green card status. You've got the plan. You know that if you trigger it, this is what's going to happen. And you've calculated that versus the damage if you stay. But it's only if and when you decide to actually trigger it by giving up your U.S. citizenship or giving up your long-term green card status that the theoretical becomes the actual. And Mark, what I would add is where the planning becomes even more intricate is not for U.S. citizens, but for green card holders, because as David and I see, and David and I have written about in our published articles and blogs, an individual might retain their green card and live outside the U.S., and so in that particular profile, the individual would be considered a U.S. income tax resident because there's an objective test for U.S. income tax residency of either the substantial presence test or just holding a green card. However, for U.S. gift, estate, and generation skip tax purposes, if the individual has no intent to move back to the U.S., it's a subjective test for transfer tax. So if I'm living in England holding a green card, I could very well be a U.S. income tax resident subject to worldwide income tax of the U.S. and subject to the U.S.-U.K. tax treaty. But for transfer tax purposes, I'm probably domiciled in England. That's my new domicile. And there was a perfect example in two recent UK prime ministers. So Boris Johnson was born in the United States, US citizen. He was unaware of, or nobody thought to advise him, of his US tax liability, and he happened to sell his home in the UK. Now, in the UK, they'd say that's you sold your principal residence, you have an exemption for principal residence, you don't have to pay any capital appreciation. But remember, he's a U.S. person for tax purposes, so the United States says, that's all very nice, but for our purposes, when we look at that, you've just disposed of an appreciated property, where's our capital gains tax? Thank you very much. And when he was informed of this, when he was about to go on a book tour, at that point he wasn't the prime minister, he was still the mayor of the city of London. His original reaction was, you know, pound sand, I'm not going to pay anything, until his banker informed him that not only do you have tax liability, we were at this point unaware of this fact, we're closing your accounts, you can't bank with us. So all of a sudden life became very difficult from not getting a mortgage, not having bank accounts, having a U.S. tax liability, and all kinds of different things. And, I mean, it never got, of course, to this extreme, but failure to file even U.S. tax returns, and was that tax evasion, etc. So he ended up giving it up, U.S. citizenship. Now we go to the current prime minister, Rishi Sunak, slightly different situation. He was born in the U.K., went to school and then worked in the United States, got a green card. Then he moved back to the U.K., became a member of Parliament for York, eventually the Chancellor of the Exchequer, that's the finance minister, and then elevated to number 10 Downing Street as the prime minister. He had a similar situation, and people said, well, my green card expired, therefore my resident alien status expired, to which I always reply, do you think you lose your U.S. citizenship when your passport expires? Of course not. But different than the citizen is, as Mel says, it's it's not for every green card holder. It's for what are called long-term green card holders. So then you get into the point that Mel just made, what years count? 
while you may have had the immigration status, does that year count for tax purposes for this calculation? And we're hoping for Prime Minister Sunak's interest that he had, you know, what we think were probably proper tax advice, but he, and he certainly made treaty elections and all, and all of those things that he did not trigger that exit tax or that inheritance tax issue. So it's a very complicated situation and you need proper advice. And unfortunately, what tends to happen is you get advisors who may be very brilliant in their area, but they're not specialist unicorns. And so I've seen horrible tax advice. I've seen horrible immigration advice. And likewise, Mel and I had another client whose immigration lawyer said, oh, well, you have to stay out of the U.S. before you renounce so that the officer will allow you to renounce your U.S. citizenship. And so this guy spent a year staying out of the U.S. On, based on this advice from, from a U.S. immigration lawyer, a top U.S. immigration lawyer. But he'd never dealt with renunciation. And I said, no, renouncing you are exercising a right. So long as you have capacity and not under duress, it doesn't matter. They're just taking your fact that you're exercising your right. And likewise, on the tax side, I just recently listened to a webinar from a tax lawyer who went on and on. Some of the tax advice Mel and I would question, but I can tell you his immigration advice was absolutely horrible and off mark. And problem is, if you don't do this right, the consequences are enormous. So our cost, the fees for fire insurance or fire escape plans and our fees, that's a rounding error compared to the cost of, of not doing it right. Mark, one of the things that I often do get involved with is remediation because many times, particularly green card holders who have moved out of the U.S., they're no longer in U.S. tax compliance. And in order to properly expatriate, so for them, that means going to David and asking him, when can I file the I-407 with the uh, CIS to voluntarily abandon my green card legal permanent residency? I have to come in and remediate because one of the things you need to do when you file a Form 8854 expatriation statement with the Internal Revenue Service is you have to certify under pains and penalty of perjury that you're fully U.S. tax compliant for the preceding five years. That means that you have filed all your FBARs, filed all your foreign filings, and you may have to perfect your treaty elections. Remember, treaty elections help a green card holder take the position as a result of a treaty that they are non-resident in the U.S. Well, for a green card holder, that's a big deal. Because for a green card holder who's not living in the U.S. and has no U.S. source income, it may be as simple as filing a 1040 NR and attaching an 8833, and then they, they would have no U.S. income tax liability. The problem for green card holders is if you file that 8833 and you don't understand the definition of a long-term green card holder, which is the so-called 8 of 15 test, you may inadvertently trip yourself up and cause an act of expatriation and the exit tax. Is there any concept of a, of a do-over? So let's say someone renounces their citizenship and after a year or five years or 10 years or some period of time, they say, actually, I want to go back. Or is it final once you renounce it? Well, th- that's a very common question that I, that I get. Again, because for a lot of people that, that they've been Americans their entire life. For those who were born abroad but had an American parent and suddenly discovered, oh, gee, I am American, it's, it's a different psychology. So I'm often asked that question. The answer is once you give up your U.S. citizenship, there's often you, you retain a U.S. parent or, sorry, spouse or child who could sponsor you, but you'd have to go through, get a green card and become naturalized again. The only theoretical way you could do it is say I didn't have capacity or I was under duress at the time I gave it up, which is a pretty high hill to climb. And so I've had lots of clients, yes, we can do this. You've still got your safety valve. In 30 years, I've yet to have a client actually do it. I had one client who said, oh, I'm thinking about doing this. And when I asked why, I said, well, uh, you can solve that by some tax planning. And he did and then never brought up the question again. So after you've gone through all the effort of kind of taking the noose of U.S. taxation from around your neck, you're a little hesitant to, to skip back up the scaffolding. Yeah, makes makes sense. Well, we're just about out of time. 
David and Melvin, I'd like to thank you for being on the show. You gave us some great insight into the complicated world of international tax. Um, how best can someone reach out to you, find out more about what you do? So for me, melvin.warshaw at gmail.com or click on melvinawarshaw.com. That's a link to my uh, website. Happy to talk with anyone. And for me, go to Mark's website to see the correct spelling of my name. It's lesbrantsassociates.com. In there, you'll find a contact. It'll say info at, I'm simply David at, lesbrantsassociates.com. And you'll find on both of our websites the articles that Mel and I have co-authored, which will go into greater depth in both of these areas. And it was a pleasure, Mark. Maybe we'll come back again next time and talk about people coming into the United States. Yeah, I'm sure we can talk hours about about this stuff. So, yeah, thanks again, um, both of you. And thanks, everyone, for, for tuning in today. Don't forget to follow the Agent of Wealth on the platform you listen from and leave us a review of the show. We're currently accepting new clients, and if you'd like to schedule a one-on-one -on -one consultation with our advisors, please do so at boutisfinancial.com backslash call. Thank you for listening to the Agent of Wealth podcast. Click the subscribe button below to be notified when new episodes become available. The information covered represents the views and opinions of the guests and does not necessarily represent the views or opinions of Boutis Financial. The content has been made available for informational and educational purposes only and is not intended to be a substitute for professional financial planning and investment advice. Always seek the advice of your financial advisor or other qualified financial service provider with any questions you may have regarding your investments and financial planning.